We're on air. Hello, dear colleagues, friends, and co thinkers. I am Irina Prokhorova, the chief editor of NLO magazine. And on behalf of um, uh, NLO, I am, I am welcoming We're you at our Bathhouse reading. It's an annual Hello, conference dear colleagues, under the auspices of and our co thinkers. Uh, I am Irina Prokhorova, the chief editor of NLO magazine. Of the 
and on to today's conference, on, um, the anthropology uh, of violence welcoming you as a society uh, and culture. It is a very uh, actual conference, conference. It's about the actions of our uh, uh, thinkers. Uh, uh, I am uh, in a panelist from the chief editor of the United States magazine. And on today's conference, the anthropology of violence because of welcoming you as a society and culture. It is a very actual conference. Today, I'm in a panelist of our thinkers. I am in a And uh, the to, to state and uh, violence. It is uh, Evgeny Blinov. It's the state university, uh, Tumen University. It's Tokyo, Moscow. The the and his topic is the ways of terror from emanation of virtue to absolute evil. The modern state of of uh, legitimizing violence. I want to add that to all those who can hear us, we, ha we are speaking for 20 minutes, there is a report, and after that, and we are accepting questions, and uh, I, I hope that all our uh, listeners in the YouTube can ask, be active asking us. Слушайте, я не перевожу, остановите спикера. Я не... Она должна была вчера мне ну, Ребят, ну вы что? Как я с этим переводу? Сейчас остановите спикера. Да? Я не перевожу а... его. Ну, ребят, ну как так делать? Государственных акторов насилия. And on uh, state uh, actors of violence, I would bring the uh, epigraph of our diplomacy, official diplomacy. We always um, and we want uh, we always um, blame our opponents for creating the final list of terrorism to accept. Uh, what would be the general principles, what the terrorism is, what is the revolt of nations, what is elective violence on the side of uh, the state. And if we speak about rhetoric, we, we, uh, we, we, we don't understand, we seem not to understand the basic principles of the European modern, because it's, it's actually within the main fundamentals of the relations between the state violence and the society and we can find some formula formulations that may seem uh, contradictory on, on, one, on the one side there is 
we can in the resolutions of United Nations we can find that state has to the international society uh, has uh, to uh, give the people the right to, re uh, to revolt but on the other hand the uh, that uh, UN resolution that uh, terrorism doesn't uh, concern the right uh, of the state for the legitimate, legitimate violence. And this is an ambiguity that can be... Uh, uh, that, that is parallel to the right of the state, of its wholeness, and the right of the people of uh, self to the self-identity. So the right to revolt and the right to use the state violence, this is self-contradictory. And we can turn to the classical formulations, first of all, about the understanding of state violence. Uh, Locke formulated uh, in his second treaty on uh, government. His last chapters are dedicated uh, uh, de uh, to, to the end of the state government, where Locke speaks about very rigidly uh, that, ter uh, that tyranny is the uh, execution of power outside the law and the society is not uh, the same as government in, in Locke's uh, understanding and Locke in his uh, very juridical rig rig rigorous way uh, identifies the um, conditions on the cancelling of the treaty between the state and the violence that the society is uh, enabled to revolt when the uh, governor is stepping outside the, uh, the outside the boundaries of the right and is not serving the public interest and Locke is doing that without any Gopsian pathos, without Leviathanus. He just shows from the behalf of you of the law and uh, from of this contract between the government and the society or the of the nation when the, this uh, contract stops its action. Uh, and Locke at the same time has this notion that the society and the state, they both are entitled into the right of violence. But the problem of violence is never specifically uh, 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 delineated. And the next uh, stage uh, come of the right to violence uh, comes to the French Revolution. After the French Revolution, it's the second uh, edition of Declaration of the Right of Man. Uh, and then when Jacobinian government comes to power, the, the, uh, the, its theoreticians like uh, Robespierre, they uh, come uh, with a very important, uh, and Saint Just and Robespierre, they come with very important um, notes about it. Uh, they, uh, the title, they, the nation is entitled to fight against tyranny, but not against the republic. It cannot fight against it save, itself. So when they have, we have republican regime, which is, which is based on the social contracts. This uh, right to revolt is not is not because isn't inherent anymore. And Robespierre makes one more step forward uh, in his famous speech of the fifth of February of the night, and uh, he speaks uh, that that the republic can use terror as a uh, as a salient mean means for uh, the uh, enabling of the um, revolutionary law. For Robespierre, the state terror is the means against abuse of the right to revolt. Uh, it's Lockean abuse, uh, which which is uh, has this second use today. Robespierre sh is showing that terror is the emanation of uh, virtue. I'm quoting Robespierre. If the moving force of the of the people's government uh, in the times of peace is virtue, then in the revolutionary period it's both virtue and terror. The virtue without which terror is horrible and terror without, uh, without which uh, uh, virtue is helpless. Uh, terror is a direct, is quick justice, it's an emanation of virtue. He is not, it is not as just a particular principle which is used uh, within the frame of democ uh, d uh, d democracy. Uh, they say that uh, terror is a means of despotic government, but it is uh, is a despotic. It is like a sword. Uh, it is like a sword that is used against tyranny. 
if 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 you use it against the enemies of uh, the de 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 desperate, it's a means of virtue. It's a, if it's used against the enemies of uh, freedom, then you, you are protecting freedom. freedom. And Robespierre is say, saying specifically and St. Just, they were lawyers by the, their profession. And both they say that there are special uh, procedures of the Revolutionary tribun tri Tribunal. They enable the, uh, they uh, perpetrate the revolutionary justice because if we uh, follow all the proceedings of the l l law, then the enemies of the revolution will uh, uh, will win. That's we don't can't allow this. That's why for uh, Robespierre Terror is the emanation of virtue. It's just direct uh, virtue. Uh, it's the incorporated virtue. And also he says that, makes a special note, that terror is the means of impact, making impact over the morals and affect uh, sensibility and sensuality, uh, sens sensitivity of, cit of the citizens, especially in the French literature they speak about. T terror is uh, the bastard of, not a, of in enlightenment, of political sentimentalism. Terror, uh, state terror, uh, it was seen as Jacobin by Jacobin, Jacobins was the way of influencing the feelings, sensitivity of the citizens. And the third uh, point, the third stage, which is very quite important, it's the it's the Russian Revolution and the red and the red terror. The famous uh, work of Trotsky, Terror and Communism, which was the answer to Kautsky in 1889, 18, 1918, when Bolsheviks dismantled the uh, uh, bourgeois government. And he was saying that uh, terror was a revolutionary practice. All people who were shot, the lists were uh, pub, uh, made public. It was a public act. Everybody arrested was not made publicly. It was a special, specific revolutionary action. And Kautsky, in his, uh, he um, blames Trotsky that uh, communists betrayed the cause of revolution. Uh, because they dismantled the February government, they are usurpers of the of power, and Kautsky formulates it's a forgotten work. Uh, he formulates a lot of argument that uh, that were uh, they were reproduced uh, uh, in the anti totalitarian discourse of 1960s after Stalin's death. So what Trotsky is answering? It, I think it's important for the understanding of the principle of the state, uh, state uh, terror. Trotsky is saying that we should not, we, we're not going to try and justify ourselves. ourselves. We, it's not only red terror, there is also white terror. We should not understand only the principle of red terror. We have to understand what is the difference between red and white terror. And in this and here Trotsky gives a paradox as a formulation it's not, not a question of law because both are Ill illegal because there is no central government and nobody can call for uh, the uh, uh, the whites are claiming that they are uh, that they are uh, lawful but they are not so nobody can call for uh, it's not a question of the targets they are uh, they are following the same target to suppress the opponent's will. It's not a question of means. Both rights and uh, whites and reds uh, are using the same means. Trotsky not, doesn't want to say that he uses different means. Yes, but they both use violence. Uh, in this way, red and white terror are no different. And the, uh, and this is not a question of some special tolerance or sensitivity that. Uh, Kautsky bl blames Bolsheviks for, and here Trotsky is saying, but they, they were, the whites are also uh, confronting the, the suppress the uh, opponents' propaganda, etc.
it's not a question of legit legitimacy. It's not the question of target or means, and and it's not the que questions of the field of application of this uh, violence. So what's the difference? And I think the uh, the white terror is doomed in the historical sense because it's the uh, terror of the uh, class uh, of the decreasing class against the increasing class and the increasing class is the one that increases uh, and um, enables the historical process he, uh, trotsky is uh, placing terror within acceleratory in, he places it in acceleratory um, scheme the russian the red uh, terror is the means to accelerate the history the historical process it's not more lawful it's not less bloody it's not more tolerant but because it follows it pursues it 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 pursues the decreasing class it, in, it enables the progress, it accelerates the progress. And Trotsky repeats Robespierre in this sense, it uh, affects the morals of the citizens. Yes, we are saying that we uh, shoot thousands to, uh, to frighten millions. Mm, and that's in this sense, the guillotine was a uh, uh, sort of humanitarian, uh, humanitarian means of uh, extermination and Russian terror was an alternative to the total elimination. R Russian t terror, he said, uh, should be always preventive in contradistinction to the white. It was. It is not aimed at, at the act, it's aimed at the possibility of the act. And this work of Trotsky, uh, it, it, it was published in 2006, with the uh, in by the publishing house Versa with Zizek's uh, introduction, and Trotsky he says that 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 here that uh, uh, however strange it may sound uh, that this French log uh, logic was reproduced by American government in the anti-terrorist uh, propaganda that this war uh, this drone warfare is the violence. Uh, uh, that enables democracy. It's all the same idea of acceleration of the progress. I don't have enough time now, but but an important uh, work of G Grimoire Shamanyu, the theory of drones, that I, I translated into Russian, that where he shows where this discursive and semantic sh shift is uh, happening, the change from what they said in the 1960s anti-revoltier doctrines, the right when they said that the uh, right of uh, 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 violence was a theoretical question, uh, they all, and the old theoreticians were saying that the class war, it, it's always the war for the population. But when we have this important semantic shift, Нет, я успеваю прекрасно, я, я один в один иду. Нет, почему я успеваю, Кирилл? I am coming to my conclusions. And uh, the fourth, uh, in my view, uh, stage of the state violence is the establishment is the change uh, uh, of the anti-revolt uh, revolt doctrine, by, which was form formulated by David Valois, who in the beginning of the 1960s fought in Algeria, uh, anti-revolt uh, uh, war, he, where he says that it's the war for the government, for the uh, population. Uh, uh, when uh, and now when we have this anti anti terrorist doctrine that replaces it uh, he, it uh, eliminates this political and juridical element and in this uh, sense uh, what Shamayo says it's the question of the um, uh, of the law state 
when the administration of Obama came to power, it uh, put into question the anti anti terrorist practice uh, of Guantanamo and practices of the anti terrorist war. And in many ways, as many clusters show, uh, the, uh, the elimination war uh, is pre the preventive extermination of terrorists is easier for the American administration, for the American establishment. It is easier. Is it's easier to put them in, than to put them in Guantanamo with a, in in uncertain status, etc. And I'm coming to my conclusions now. Uh, as as to the understanding of the state violent violence, there are three or four important stages of the understanding of the state violence and of the state uh, terror uh, terror. I think that the problem of terror which emerges as Agamben uh, wrote it's the, the state of exception it's the terra nulla bet between the uh, law and the uh, and the practice and the terrorists became this terra nulla nobody's land and i think there are C complete dead ends in the discussion of terrorism. There are several of them, and the, the legitimation of violence, because in the end of it, as strangers may see terrorism, it can be the cannot be the problem of extra violence, because when uh, the seizure of the uh, the seizure of people is always a um, terroristic act. The, the, it's not a problem of uh, legitimation of delegitimation because the, both sides come to justification of a violence that never uses the needs justification for these uh, regimes of uh, uh, exclu exclusion when the st juridical status is uncertain is uncertain as trotsky used to say it do doesn't need justification uh, both state and non-actor state are not searching for justification and that's why the distinction between state and non-state uh, violence in historical context of a long perspective it's not relevant because the problem of uh, terror uh, comes from uh, changes hands between uh, between states and terrorists and uh, uh, the, the uh, this terrorist call themselves lawful uh, violence and or the state may call it a state of violence but it's uh, it's uh, doesn't change its meaning and if uh, the third the shamayun like theoreticians like shamayun used to say that they spoke about the deviation uh, from classical european the right to revolt to the uh, and to the idea that that the revolteers can be that that, that that can represent deeper demands of the population and and I, uh, as a and I want to come to the five uh, positive waves of discussing the terror we shouldn't forget first that that terror is always as French thinkers as is a bastard child is a it's a illegitimate child of the enlightenment enlightenment sentimentalism it always affects the feelings and that's the problem of, of physical violence it can it, and the, the, that's why the problem of physical violence is uh, arbitrary and uh, uh, the civil society the problem it's always the terrorist problem, always the problem of definitions. And we can see that not only in Russia, we have um, a key term, extremism in Russia, which can, which can actually engulf any, encompass any, any kind of protest activity. But into the, to this broadened uh, interpretation of extremism, this tendency, we can see the same tendency in France uh, we, and many religious rituals and traditions. Uh, it can, uh, we, can be named uh, as extremism in USA when the supporters of Trump uh, 
was seen as, by some parts of the democratic uh, establishment, they were seen as extremists. And in the end of it, I think that civil society is very interested in the rigorous definition of terrorism, although it's a very complicated task. And of course, it's a problem of institutions. The problem of institutional power and the frames uh, within which they should be acting, like FSB in Russia and uh, uh, the same uh, organizations in the United States, similar organizations. And I, what I, I, the other point that the, some theoreticians, uh, uh, Zizek, for example, they're always saying that the state terror is always is byproduct of ideal of ideology. ideology. Uh, I don't think that this is. Uh, we, we can uh, the, the byproduct of progressive discourse, but we cannot actually step outside the frame of progressive discourse. I think this is a problem of uh, acceleration, that uh, we, we're thinking that we, we can we say that through the uh, means of the radical state violence, we can accelerate the pro progress. And these are the problems uh, uh, overlooked, uh, seen by, uh, researched into by Robespierre, Trotsky. And I think that we can find some question, uh, answers to the questions in history. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Colleagues, I suggest uh, the, the discussion, whether you have any questions to the, uh, to, to the speaker. Raise your hands, please. If, uh, if there are no questions, I, I wanted to ask a question myself. Although this is an important theme, but it's not quite my theme. But I think that the most important um, uh, mo uh, mo element and that has most impact is when we um, take uh, terror outside the uh, scope of ethics. If French revolutionaries uh, see saw um, terror as virtue, they had to prove that this is for the best of the people's interest. But what uh, you, you used the uh, words of Trotsky, it's a new, uh, the new step. Of course, this is illegal, but roughly speaking, this, if this is perspe perspective, if we can uh, d discard the ethic uh, category. And this is a uh, so, so the um, developed uh, modern society is completely immoral, and I think this—I think this is an important uh, question. Probably, I, I misunderstood you, and you, your analysis of this situation today is based on the same principle that we are discarding the ethical element, and then we are, and then we'll rationalize about it, etc., etc. Of course, if we, we are speaking about totalitarian states, but we, if we are if we are speaking the, about the state, lawful states, uh, uh, are they discarding the uh, ethical states, uh, the ethical element too? Thank you for the question so much. I think this is a complicated question. Uh, in some sense, Trotsky states that there is an uh, old moral and new moral the old morals that is based uh, on the, uh, and this, uh, which is, uh, was um, uh, the moral of the de decreasing classes, but the increasing classes is the higher ethics that allows us ignore uh, the, what we traditionally call ethics in some sense. But in this uh, Trotsky, Conf with this Trotsky confronts Kautsky, who calls himself himself uh, a Marxist, but who doesn't understand the dialectic character of historical process, that in this uh, process of confrontation of classes, all the ethical questions are discarded. But I think what's important what, for Trotsky, which is important, it's a question uh, where history goes who understands and who can influence that movement.
And I think that in the context of revolution, I think that the builders of the communists and revolutionaries, they try to convince themselves that that the logic of class uh, battle is the highest ethics. And I think uh, that's where Zizek sees the parallel with today. And I think that he says that this is the logic. If we understand, we can make a projection uh, from the uh, ideas of the class battle and, and the battle between proletariat and uh, the old classes and the ideas that we have to install forci forcibly democracy because uh, Zizek is saying that we are uh, this is an argument of historical acceleration I think that the problem of ethics and morals they are discarded not with uh, within the frames of the uh, uh, you know, battles of the classes but within the this, the idea that the higher the idea that we have, can highly accelerate the historical process through the uh, uh, through using violence and in this way violence will always be justified from the point of view of the state because it's the violence that finally leads to the development of the society that is why it's, it's not the problems of means and targets, which is not uh, specifically European or specifically Soviet or modern. I think that this is a problem of uh, that, that we can radically accelerate uh, social progress through the violent means. And in the, at that moment, we even don't notice our, ourselves when we become Trotskyists the old morals is discarded and we see ourselves as the carriers of the progress we are progressors as they used to say in this soviet times we are using radical violence to bring progress and that's how we can um, uh, channel the progress into the needed uh, into the needed riverbed um, but i think that this uh, idea of installing the progress it's not Trotsky's uh, idea all colonial wars were based on the same pro principles we are developed civilization there is progress and we are installing forcibly we forcify progress over them this is a civil civilized violence and I think I think here is the crossing point of so uh, many uh, uh, thought ideas are, uh, uh, it's not necessarily connected with left-wing thinking and the justification of violence through progress it's a famous story this is a this has, has been played out by many many uh, streams of uh, many thinkers and uh, thought doc and doctrines but there is a next question in the in the uh, 2000s when we for example they when they had protests against iraq war when then there were without leaders people used to come out in the streets it's uh, millions were coming outside the idea of the rejection of violence is a system of uh, government it becomes actual from this point of view don't you see that there is a, do you see a kind of in inherent conflict conflict between the society that doesn't want to justify admit violence as the use as the use of government and the uh, this system uh, or the, the the use of this uh, old uh, instruments of uh, justific justifying the state violence of course there is a possibility of contradiction in the aforementioned book of Shamayun that is d dedicated to, to to the drone warfare he shows how this tragedy in the, the american establish establishment how the war uh, how the war uh, with drones helps you to avoid extra 
extra ch expenses there people uh, are um, protesting against uh, big financial expenses the break of the international law etc etc and the use of drones uh, lets you to sort of um, uh, uh, discard all this, uh, all those difficult points, and also decrease your expenses and 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 the costs. Yes, of course, uh, there is a problem here, but but the problem is when how I started my um, report. People are protesting, and that's how they fix the right to revolt, the right to bring the government down and people protest and when for example you have our arab revolution arab spring then arab uh, so opinion uh, general opinion is always supporting the uh, the protesters but then the development the aftermath is less predictable of course there is a contradiction between uh, on the level of po political practice and on the level of the principle when we fix the right to revolt uh, against the government but the question here we have to delineate, delineate here make, make a line draw a line here to what extent uh, we, we can take the pro the protest if people come out to the streets can they search the uh, can they search the uh, buildings can they fight the policemen can they uh, can they use weapons uh, in Myanmar they are creating the army the people's army so the question of violence is structurally is not well de defined or predetermined when we accept the right to protest and the and protesting against the war in this way we can provoke indirectly the conflicts in the society in which we have no notion about or clue about it is the question of how we uh, where we draw the line where we are supporting the right to uh, to revolt and where is the borderline after which uh, the state violence becomes legitimate or becomes illegitimate and i think that this uh, uh, the, 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 there is no certain line here it is blurred and that's why here is he was the core of the argument between kautsky and brodsky kautsky thought that social democracy can win the elections and and trotsky was saying no you will never come to power in the in the contemporary conditions through elections <laughs> no, uh, on the one hand we're speaking about the protest protest against violence and as marxists would put it uh, the dialectical process and we become indir uh, indirectly uh, responsible for the process of violence uh, in the societies which we don't know about and that's why we have to there are two more questions and we don't have enough time Tatiana Weiser, if in some co conflict situation uh, the sides come, uh, co confront, if the two sides come uh, that they differently de determine, this, describe themselves uh, in, in, uh, in uh, relation to government, if there is, uh, if you have different definitions about that. Uh, so uh, when, when the two uh, states two governments uh, confront each other when have the very different legitimation of violence and the ideas of that i think the the answer lies in the fact in how we in we can see through the uh, quasi uh, progressive uh, prism uh, we can uh, see that in this conflict the uh, victory of one side will stop the progress and the others as we understand it and the other side uh, is uh, taking the nation back historically but there is no uh, 
not, not, there is not one interpretation. It's the question of pragmatic description. How we describe the participants of such um, uh, the participants of uh, such conflict, Palestine and Israel. For example, we describe Israel as a modern state and Pal and the confronting side as something archaic. It's archaic state. Uh, it's a, it's a nationalistic, religious, fundamentalism, etc. If we use such type of description, then we uh, we can see immediately uh, which side is progressive and which side is not, and which side which victory will be progressive. I think that's the problem of description. And this is the next question: Does it mean that that uh, the taking of this? State uh, uh, beyond the frames of ethical dis uh, discourse. Does this mean that the other side will do the same? Uh, the, the the purpose of every overstepping of the states. Uh, I would say no. I think that the the purpose for taking the uh, state uh, terror outside the ethic boundaries and legitimi legitimizing of the state uh, violence. As Trotsky says to us, because I spoke about Trotsky, state by legitimizing violence, even if it, it calls it terror, it tries to delegitimize the actions of the other side. So the question would be, uh, the question was whether the state would uh, admit that the other side ha is also entitled to take the terror outside the ethical boundaries. If the state takes itself outside the ethical baron, ba uh, uh, boundaries, uh, it won't justify uh, by in the same way the non-state actors in their violence. It's asymmetrical. It's a, a, asymmetrical action. Uh, in short, it's a, uh, an attempt uh, of sacralization of power that it allows itself something it doesn't allow the, uh, the, to anybody else. And how, and how, uh, what is the relation between discourses of po violence of the state and uh, the practices, whether they reflect uh, the discourse or not. I think it depends. It, I think it depends on the concrete situation. We can easily imagine, and we can see it on the examples of uh, Arab Spring, when initially Arab the state, uh, Euro, uh, Western states supported uh, supported the, rev the revoltiers, the uprising, and expressed the hope that the pro pro uh, protestants would change the system and establish democracy. And then, uh, and suddenly, uh, the situation develops in a different way, and those countries do not come to democracy. This, but there is no way back. And now we are using the principle of the lesser evil. For example, in Egypt, when brother, Muslim brothers came to power, but then Muslim brothers frightened everyone, and then the military dictatorship came to power, which came in the same terroristic, uh, uh, which in the same terroristic and illegitimate way uh, arrested president and uh, suppressed the uprising. But and West said nothing. Uh, obviously showing a contradiction to its own uh, rhetoric uh, of uh, that every change of power should be always performed democratically and the purpose is the democratic society but at a certain point there was a pr pragmatic decision taken uh, that military dictatorship is better than Muslim, uh, fundamentalist government and at this, on this example, we can show, see that the official rhetoric, rhetoric of the democratization of these societies, the non-Western societies, it uh, 
becomes uh, it comes into contradiction to the uh, practices. Thank you so much. I am glad that we have uh, that the discussion is so thriving. I want to thank the reporter. Thank you, Evgeny. Yes. <laughs> and now. And we're going on to the second. On air. And the floor goes to our second speaker for today, Oleg Hlivniuk at the International Center for the History and Sociology of World War II, a High School of Economics, uh, Moscow. The theme of his uh, presentation, who and how much victims of Stalinism in academic historiography and historical imagination in contemporary Russia. The floor is yours, Oleg. Oleg, thank you very much. Uh, let me remind you that um, in different historical periods in Russia, there were different historical examples of extreme state violence uh, in the 20th and the 21st century, this place is firmly and rightfully occupied by the dictatorship of Stalin. In state ideology, mass perceptions and scientific historiography, the phenomenon of extreme state violence uh, plays a critical role. For mass political perceptions, uh, this is the most understandable example either to follow or to deny. This is a way to criticize the modern state uh, kind of participation in the current political processes. Uh, interest towards these phenomena uh, from the historians is explained by the fact that the level of state violence uh, most uh, clearly characterizes uh, one system or another. If we're to talk about the Stalin period, it's clear that uh, none of the events uh, or phenomena can be understood without taking into account the factor of terror given different motivations and uh, mass perceptions and uh, studies of Stalinism. They usually um, follow parallel courses, uh, rarely intersecting. Let me remind me, you some of the mass historical myths uh, that have been circulating, despite the fact uh, that there is uh, historical evidence uh, to defy the myths. For instance, uh, it was uh, the bosses that were repressed uh, and uh, they got what they deserved uh, for thievery and corruption. Arrests uh, uh, followed uh, denunciations uh, that uncovered they had to respond to. Stalin had nothing to do to organizing terror. Everything was done against his will by local heads and authorities. Uh, this, this list can go on. Uh, but uh, today I will talk about uh, an issue which uh, is not only mythologized in mass perceptions, uh, uh, but is also not comprehended enough historiographically. Paradoxically enough, we're going to talk about uh, a question, the answer to which uh, should precede any research of Stalinist state violence, uh, how many victims there were and who should be considered to be victims of Stalinism. Despite a huge number of different publications about Stalinism, the Gulag, and historical historiography, there is no comprehensive research uh, on the statistics or on the system of state violence overall. What we need to begin with is the fact that state violence uh, over the course of this uh, period, uh, despite the fact it was targeting certain social groups, it was very dispersed uh, and could potentially affect anyone. People were shot, uh, sent to camps, um, there were mass deportations, and within the system, 
they only contributed the tip of the iceberg. Millions of people were arrested with no sentences. People were convicted but not imprisoned. People were subjected to severe discrimination on the basis of collective responsibility. The quantitative assessment of each of these uh, categories uh, is very hard to do. The key difficulty, the key challenge here is the imperfection of official stats, uh, the double count of convicts, um, etc. As a result, uh, this uh, sort of estimates uh, are lacking in our research. Uh, omitting numerous methodological details, uh, I shall present uh, the results uh, of my research and my calculations, they can serve as a starting point uh, for developing generally accepted parameters that are lacking. These indicators uh, would uh, cover the so-called net number of uh, people repressed in each of the categories uh, with no double counts. So, in uh, 1930 to 1952, there were about 1 million people that were shot. So plus an unknown number of people that were shot uh, with no sentences, no judgments. About 70 million prisoners uh, went through camps, uh, col uh, colonies and prisons. About 6 million uh, people were deported. About 2 million people were sent to prisons following an arrest with no formal conviction, so they never went to trial. About 23 million people were sentenced uh, without being imprisoned, received sentences other than imprisonment. So merging these indicators into a single whole remains an important task. We need to avoid double counting, although it's not quite yet clear how that can be done. But overall, we are convinced uh, that we can talk about tens of millions of Soviet citizens that in one way or another experienced some kind of punishment uh, during the Stalinist period uh, alongside quantifying terror and state violence. Uh, a critical role is played by qualitative assessments. Uh, the separation of political and non-political convicts uh, would be critical. Within the existing tradition, there is a very rigid boundary between them. As a general rule, the victims of political Repression include those that were condemned uh, by the infamous Article 58. All of the others are often considered common criminals uh, that exist in any state. The number of political convicts is presented on the slide. There are about 4 million convicts uh, for political reasons, according to the criteria of official statistics, mainly under Article 58. About 4 million in 1930, 1952. It is customary to add, and this is the right way to proceed, the 6 million that were deported, that were undoubtedly persecuted for political reasons. An open question remains about uh, how we should qualify those that were formally non-politically replaced. Were they criminals? Were they convicts? It's a complex issue that requires extensive, in-depth research. I would like to share some preliminary observations. First of all, I have to note that some of those that were convicted under ordinary articles were in fact political convicts and prisoners. For example, the so-called kulaks, uh, at a certain period, they were sent to camps uh, under the article for speculation. Although the actual motive, and nobody would hide the fact, uh, were political cleansing of the villages. These categories of converts uh, require further systematization. Moving on, uh, it's necessary to focus uh, on some generic indicators of the structure of court sentences passed uh, um, during the Stalinist period. As you can see in this table, that for typical criminal offences, such as murder, hooliganism, robberies, etc., 
a small proportion of court sentences would be passed. You can see on the slide, uh, these are decimals of percentages uh, or a few percent. What's uh, drawn our attention to is the huge number of sentences that were passed uh, under mass campaigns uh, uh, that had to do with the criminalization of the socio-economic relations in the country. About 16 million people were convicted just for violations of labor discipline or unauthorized uh, dismissal from work. Uh, this is uh, data for 1940 to 1956, uh, when these decrees prevailed. These kind of criminal sanctions uh, were very specific to the Stalinist legal system. It criminalized uh, those spheres of socio-economic relations that are not generally criminalized uh, or are not criminalized as harshly in more moderate systems, uh, including the USSR before and after Stalin. Would it be correct uh, to classify these millions of convicted persons as criminals? To answer these questions, uh, well, there's usually objections uh, that are raised. Uh, each era must be judged by its laws uh, taken into account or so the specific historical context. Accepting this objection, let's turn to real actual practices of the way uh, legislation under Stalin was implemented, the extreme cases. First of all, we need to find out whether extreme legislation was perceived as justified by the contemporaries themselves, uh, primarily by professionals and those that were part of the judicial and the prosecutional system. We don't have enough time now to go into detail, but I'll focus on some of the typical examples uh, concerning uh, the decree uh, from 1947 on the embezzlement of state property, which was typical for criminalization during the times. On the slide, uh, you can see an address uh, from the prosecution and justice to Stalin um, in April 1951. They were offering to review the rules of the law on theft and embezzlement, uh, the law from 1947, pointing out its excessive brutality and the fact that it was unjustified. They wrote that the seven-year sentence, and that was the minimum sanction under the decree, were given to people that committed minor violation and they were pushed to those due to difficult living conditions. So, for example, they were talking about an invalid of war who was condemned uh, for seven years for stealing a loaf of bread from the bakery he was working in, or a mother of a minor child who lost her husband during the war and she received seven years uh, for stealing a kilogram of rice. This kind of uh, uh, professional rejection um, were partially raised by this awareness, this rejection of these draconian laws. So, again, I have to limit myself, unfortunately, to just one example. A letter from a student, a, a pupil of a rural school, uh, to Stalin. Uh, this letter was, in fact, uh, handed over to Stalin, it reached him, but as other similar appeals, uh, it did not arouse his interest. The letter read, uh, as you can see on the slide, it talks about two collective farmers uh, that were being tried for stealing grain, bread. The author wrote, uh, well, it's not because uh, they were well off that they had to steal. Perhaps there were children hungry during the winter if uh, they had a better way of life, perhaps uh, it would have been legitimate uh, to give them 10 years uh, for stealing grain. They were forced to steal, and that's not fair. You need to create tolerable life conditions, and then you can judge people. So these examples, uh, and there is a multitude of these examples, you can definitely give many more, indicate the fact that contemporaries, uh, including uh, professional lawyers, uh, estimated these extreme decrees uh, uh, 
that were used to convict millions of people as unjust and excessive. And it's not, and there's no reason why we should treat them differently today. It's obvious uh, that within the Stalinist uh, system of uh, state uh, violence, uh, a lot of people found themselves uh, behind bars. Uh, uh, the severity of their punishment uh, did not correspond uh, to uh, the danger of the crime. So the misdemeanors and the significant proportion of those that were convicted were ordinary Soviet citizens uh, who violated these excessively harsh laws uh, due to difficult living conditions uh, or because uh, they were uh, victims to various demonstrative campaigns to restore order in the state. Uh, these uh, convents uh, uh, cannot be considered to be purely uh, criminals. Uh, among them, um, the so-called pure political uh, convicts, uh, and the line between them is very blurry. Ultimately speaking, both of these categories were victims uh, of uh, criminal um, state violence. The facts that I've listed and the observations that I've shared uh, indicate uh, the fact that the problems of uh, state violence, uh, the historical aspects, uh, uh, require further research. Uh, even in relation to such a well-known phenomenon as uh, Stalinism. this would also apply. This kind of research will help us to better understand the essence and the mechanism of the development of dictatorships uh, and tyrannies. Uh, and uh, that's why I think it's important uh, to get to the most accurate quantities of assessment and qualities of characteristics of the state Soviet experience of uh, state violence. Uh, thank you. That's uh, briefly what I wanted to talk to you about today. And uh, well, let's discuss. We can discuss uh, in more detail now via questions. Uh, if we do have questions, thank you so much. Irina, thank you. Great. Uh, so we have some questions. Uh, I'm not sure. First, I will ask uh, the participants of the conference. Does anybody want to ask any questions? Um, perhaps our colleagues will know, not yet. Uh, okay, so before I read the question that I consider to be very important, uh, well, it's not so much a question, it's a comment uh, that I wanted to share. I think uh, you raised a, a very important uh, topic. Uh, talking about this other norm that we need to use to uh, judge uh, a different era, but you were convincing and saying that people did understand that this norm was violated even back then, even after the Civil War, after the First World War. But definitely, uh, the population was very militarized, there was a lot of aggression. Nonetheless, this was perceived still as excessive. But then the problem is, in the historical material itself, uh, a lot of people that uh, would insist uh, that that was the norm back then, in one way or another, what they used to judge uh, uh, the era is they, they used the of official product, uh, the successive official material that could create the illusion that people would accept this norm. So my question is, clearly some of the facts uh, keep uh, coming up. Uh, but there were materials that testify the opposite, and uh, they are much fewer. And here's a question of historical knowledge. If you're lacking arguments, what do you do about this? So what do you do with facts that were concealed? Of course, there were diaries. Of course, uh, people would uh, uh, try to keep a private diary. But this is private memories. This is a different sphere. How can it uh, counter this uh, excessive official propaganda? And what do we do with that? Uh, I like, well, there are two aspects that we could consider here. One, you mentioned uh, this attempt uh, to reconstruct uh, mass perception, mass uh, um, attitudes uh, towards uh, various uh, historic uh, acts, uh, Stalinist uh, acts, etc. And another important aspect here is a more attentive way of working with the documents um, from uh, the authorities that would implement all of these uh, rules. Um, in fact, they did understand and even talked about the fact that they were aware 
that these laws uh, were unjust and that they were excessive and they had to be corrected they had to be amended and as soon as there was no oh, as, as soon as stalin died they did do it uh, uh, so the re repressive authorities themselves realized that it was too much right uh, I'm like yes precisely that's way too much come on guys that's uh but nobody could do it so in my opinion I think it's uh, an important argument uh, uh, to promote our understanding and uh, research uh, of uh, the Stalin criminal non-political uh, judicial system. So these are the terms I think about this and this is the way I conceptualize this. Perhaps there'll be other way. At least this is the questions that we should be asking ourselves. Uh, we're too harsh in terms of uh, distributing, breaking down everybody into various uh, groups, compartmentalizing political, non-political, etc. The non-political were just criminals, uh, and these are like non-criminals. Uh, criminals, this is a very vague uh, understanding. Criminals are murderers, criminals are thieves. Uh, but there are other categories, intermediary categories. Uh, in the camps, they were called like uh, everyday criminals. Uh, these things need to be taken into account. Uh, otherwise, we'll never be able to understand uh, what uh, a Stalinist violence was about, state violence. Irina, I think that uh, this uh, breakdown uh, leads to the, this trauma. If we were to quantify everything, it would be such an astonishingly like, huge number. That's why people are trying to, like, we're talking about reducing these numbers. They're saying, like, that's not true. There were some that were justly convicted. Let's keep the numbers low. What I'm uh, astonished by in, in the current idealization of uh, the period, people normalize terror, in fact. It's important for people often to prove uh, that people were justly convicted. Uh, but they never asked themselves the question of uh, the fact that Gulag itself uh, was way was not a legal establishment, uh, even if people were justly sent uh, to, uh, they should have been sent to prison, strictly speaking, not a Gulag. That was way beyond, in, in, in our culture, it's just so in-depth, it's so ingrained in our culture, people don't even ask themselves the question that this whole system, this lack of fair justice, that the gulags uh, should not exist in a civilized society. People don't even ask themselves these questions. They don't even question it. So our legal awareness is lagging behind, uh, even in this respect, uh, not even talking about the number of people that were sent to uh, prisons. So, Alec, that's an important uh, question, of course. Uh, not the gulag itself, perhaps, so the, the formal gulag uh, that was uh, legitimized uh, by various laws, but the actual gulag. Uh, which was not a place of punishment, it would often turn into a place of destruction. And people were not condemned to destruction, they were condemned to, for, to imprisonment. Uh, and in this state, uh, the state was uh, being uh, not legitimate in its violence. Irina, we have a question uh, from Alexandra Lusov. Uh, uh, could Stalinist terror be perceived in the aspect of uh, privatizing uh, Trotsky's uh, ideas on preventive violence? Uh, like, well, strictly speaking, preventive violence is not Trotsky's idea. It's not his concept, as we heard in the previous presentation. It's an idea that goes back to the French Revolution. It's the concept behind the First World War and uh, the authorities of uh, the time would uh, widely rely on the preventive violence and uh, purchases of uh, various uh, entire regions. Uh, the uh, first uh, concentration camps uh, uh, that appeared uh, during the Berg Wars. Uh, you're, you're setting the question correctly. It's definitely the right question to ask. Uh, we should be exploring these concepts of preventive violences and purges uh, if we take the most well-known phenomenon as 1937, 1938, for instance. Uh, that's uh, a very illustrative example of uh, how a preventive purges uh, would occur. These are imaginary, not real fifth uh, column at that point uh, and that's when the term was coined in fact already 1937 1938 so that's uh, 
we're in the midst of uh, the war in Spain, uh, and that's where the term is coined, uh, and uh, people start using it. Uh, and uh, in all of the documents, uh, in uh, the Czechist discussions among themselves and the instructions that they would receive, uh, there is this uh, constant coming back to this idea that we're getting ready for war. And that's why we need to eliminate uh, millions of enemies, potential enemies, uh, to make sure that uh, in the event of the war, they don't harm us. Uh, this idea is very clearly read in all of the documents uh, um, during uh, the Great Terror. But not only that, even in the post-war period, uh, this is something that's uh, very apparent. Uh, people, you could say that they were getting ready for a new war, the Third World War, but the, the logic is similar. The logic is very consistent. Uh, and it's a very great observation to make. You're absolutely right. Uh, Irina, another question that I had. Um, the, the figures, uh, the stats that you've been sharing, uh, do they include uh, the results of collectivization? Alongside uh, people that were exiled, people that died of hunger. Um, this is a huge army of people, right? Uh, I, I don't think anybody ever quantified and counted them. Is that even possible? Like, well, strictly speaking, if uh, we talk about uh, um, criminals that were persecuted in the villages themselves by the villages, well, that's not included into the stats. Uh, but what the stats do include, uh, collectivization is, uh, on the one hand, setting up collective farms, uh, this whole mass engagement, uh, forceful engagement uh, um, of uh, peasants into the process. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we're talking about uh, mass uh, punitive measures uh, uh, that were guided by the same principles of uh, threatening people, this preventive purges, uh, clear out everybody who can potentially resist uh, the collective farm system. And this uh, campaign and uh, the violent element uh, would consist on the one hand of mass arrests, uh, people being sent to camps and people being shot, and this is included in the stats that I shared. On the other hand, uh, we need to factor in those that were deported, uh, six million people, two million people of those, uh, of those deported were kulaks uh, and their families. What we did not factor into these stats so uh, were the people that uh, decided to step away from being collects themselves. Uh, people that were wary, that were uh, afraid of potential arrests uh, or of being exiled, uh, and they left their farms, uh, uh, they left their houses and they escaped. Uh, they escaped from the villages uh, just to save themselves and their families. Uh, this was uh, definitely a challenge. Um, and uh, I think that a part of these people, well, it's not that I think, I'm absolutely sure, there's just no documents to prove it, but um, that must have been the case. Uh, sooner or later, of course, uh, they were caught by the system uh, and they were traced by and covered there. And uh, they would be exiled either way or shot even uh, or subjected to other forms of discrimination. But it's this category of people that uh, chose themselves uh, to leave uh, their Kulak uh, lifestyle. But in fact, they were also victims to collectivization. Uh, they were not included in these stats that I shared. Uh, and I think this is the right approach. Uh, when we talk about the system of violence overall, and this is what I tried to do in the first part of my presentation, you need to understand that uh, it's not focused on uh, like a few p bullet points. That's not how it works. Like some people were arrested and that some were exiled and uh, others people were arrested and shot. Uh, it just penetrated the entire society and it would come in very different forms. People could be exiled, uh, people could be rid of their rights uh, to get bread. They were not given the, the food cards. Uh, they could be fired uh, from their work. Uh, people could be moved from the cities, the towns that they lived in, the, the, the houses. Uh, 
And if you try to sort of think that this applies to you, well, that, that's not a big deal. You might think, okay, you had to, you were forced to move from a different city. You had to go and move from, so elsewhere. Maybe that's the way to see it. Uh, but if you just think about that, this could be possible as applied to you. And like tomorrow people would come after you and say, you've got three hours, pack all your stuff. Uh, and we have to move you wherever like we think you should be with no house in there waiting for you, no work, nobody cared about any of that. Then you can just begin to imagine the, the, the level of terror, if you will, that people would feel in a similar situation. Irina, well, we have another question from uh, Oleg Valuev. Uh, um, would this be a development of Sakharov's ideas about prisoners uh, whose legal status uh, is nivellated uh, when uh, norms are lost uh, and uh, the entire society is traumatized? Uh, Oleg, well, yes, I do think that, uh, well, this is something that we embarked on already in our discussion. The system, uh, the punitive system itself, uh, it should be legal, it should be legitimate. Uh, even if it's very cruel, it has to be guided by certain norms of law. And when we start talking about a system that it turns uh, it, rather than uh, um, a system that delivers punishment uh, into a system that administers additional punishment, uh, additional, additionally traumatizing the convicts, the victims, uh, then of course that's exactly what we would be talking about. Uh, uh, people would die millions in the gulags uh, of uh, hunger, malnutrition, uh, or there would be a lot of mortality because of uh, uh, backbreaking labor that they were forced to, to perform uh, or various um, types of um, delays. Uh, they would be kept in gulag beyond the time the sentence that were given and there were other means or other ways of uh, adding to the punishment uh, and this serves as an additional factor that uh, would um, intensify the state violence that we're talking about thank you so much uh, of course this is a huge topic uh, and it's always relevant. Uh, I'm not going to be adding, um, asking any further questions. What I think is important to focus on here as well, roughly speaking, these are official norms, uh, the institutions uh, and uh, everything that's beyond uh, uh, the legal practices. Uh, going back to the 1960s, uh, when we got back to uh, the Lenin norms of flawed, that was a way to at least get in the system back to some kind of uh, social totalitarian, but still a legal norm. Uh, and what I think is important here, and this uh, requires uh, further research and uh, further enlightenment. Uh, I know that in mass perceptions, people don't understand how the labor code worked during the Stalinism era. And when I say, for instance, well, you could never quit your job. If you were working in a factory, you could never quit unless you were allowed by your boss. Uh, and that was served them in a way. And people are not aware of that. Uh, if you were late for work, you could go to prison. And you were completely tied to these plants, these factories, um, places of work, um, which is naturally was never made official. It was a practice uh, that was a complete contradiction to any constitutional norms. Uh, I'm like, well, everybody knew about these. Uh, and 16 million people from 1940s to 1956 were convicted for, for this type of like criminal offenses, so to say, a, a huge amount of people undoubtedly. So right, we have very distorted perception of the way people used to live during the era. Irina, thank you so much. Uh, and Evgeny is raising his hand, I think. he's. Irina, yes, okay, Evgeny, please go ahead. The very last question. Yes, the very last uh, question. Oleg, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was incredibly interesting. I have a question. I think the issue that we might be facing in terms of, uh, like when we talk about uh, a great terror, I think uh, 
we need to articulate some concepts uh, during the revolutionary wars uh, terror did not um, would position itself as terror and lists of those that were shot would be printed. It was honest terror. It was frank terror. It termed itself terror. Uh, the Stalinist practices uh, uh, was a completely different representation of violence. Uh, the relatives would never know for, for 10 or 15 years that people were, for instance, were um, sentenced to death. Uh, uh, and this terror would never present itself as terror. This uh, problem of uh, representation of uh, violence, uh, the difference between military communism and Stalinist purges, uh, discourse-wise, there was a huge difference. Uh, uh, and these uh, languages of uh, self-description and self-nomination, how would you resolve this? Uh, terror that does not name itself terror. Terror that does not reveal itself, essentially. Oleg, I understood what you're talking about. This is a widespread issue. The difference uh, between... Uh, the so-called uh, revolutionary Bolshevism that was on the rise uh, and the declining dictatorship and uh, terror that ensued. Uh, and this would, uh, you would see that uh, across the board in the culture sphere or... They would start off with uh, experiments uh, and then go on to extreme conservatism. What you talked about just now, it, it, it's true and not true in a way. What was happening um, through those years uh, would be termed a revolutionary terror, of course. Uh, and in a way, it was uh, open and frank. Uh, remember these uh, Moscow uh, litigations, uh, for instance, uh, that uh, were widely talked about and similar um, proceedings would take uh, in the region, so, but a lot was concealed, of course. Uh, millions of people that were convicted, uh, and these would be tacit, uh, these uh, proceedings uh, would be secret. In this way, this type of terror wasn't open. I do think that we can still use the term, the great terror, Although we know that these were like planned, uh, ordered uh, campaigns, uh, quotas uh, for people shot, etc. But uh, well, this term I think uh, is uh, very understandable. It's uh, a way to pinpoint uh, the the essence. I think, even though that it might not be scientifically the most precise one, I still think that uh, uh, we should continue to use it. Uh, that's the way I would put it. That's. Irina, on this optimistic uh, note, uh, I guess uh, we're ready to um, complete the discussion on the second presentation. Thank you very much. We continue our 27th Bad House meetings, uh, Anthropology of Violence. Uh, just in case, I remind to the people who just joined, uh, our section is State and Violence today. And before I pass the, the word to our third uh, 
speaker. I, uh, I ask all the uh, our audience to participate in, in the discussion. After each report, we're having the discussion. I, I am I'm happy to introduce our third uh, our third speaker, Lynn Ellen Patek, Dartmouth College of uh, uh, USA. Location is tactic and discourse. A study of two political cultures, Russia versus US. Lynn, one slower. Lynn, now you. All right. Um, may I share my screen so that I can show my slideshow? I'm sh Ребята, вы слышите, я должна на русский сейчас прекратиться, да? Can you see my screen? Um, are you able to see my slides? All right, good. That's what I wanted to know. All right, first of, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Irina Prokhorova for inviting me to the bath readings. It's an honor to be here today. Um, my title you can see on the slide, and Irina just said it. It's the violence of provocation as tactic and discourse, a study of two political cultures. So I'm going to begin with a somewhat provocative quote. Um, they, um, they, that is the political left, have decided that there are some things you shouldn't say anymore. And when you say one of those things, you become the enemy. But words aren't violence, they're just words. Thus concludes Donald Trump Jr. in his book called Triggered, How the Left Thrives on Hate and Wants to Silence Us published in 2019. My paper today will examine the false dichotomy of words violence in the operation of provocation as a political communication and a strategy and performance. I will argue that provocation fundamentally calls into question what is violence and what violence is. By confounding narratives of causality as well as subject object, perpetrator, victim, and word deed distinctions. The provocateur's violence is subsumed within the co-optation of the other's agency, which becomes the provocateur's surrogate or medial extension to achieve the objective of their provocation. While provocation is a universal communication strategy, it has culturally specific forms within national histories, political cultures, and media ecosystems. My discussion will take its examples from contemporary Russian and American political culture in order to argue that despite divergent histories and linguistic usage of the word um, provocatia, provocation, the tactical methods are structurally and functionally similar. I will begin by talking briefly about provocation's discursive formations, how and in what context the word is used in Russophone and Anglophone, specifically American culture. But my ultimate interest here is in provocation as a political tactic and the two theories or frameworks that best capture the operation of this tactic. My central concern is to distinguish between two widespread and highly effective forms of political provocation, what I'll refer to as manipulative provocation and advers adversarial provocation, and to analyze a sensationally successful and consequential instance of each type. Excellent. In Russia, especially in political and media discourse, the word provocation, provokatsia, has much greater salience and resonance. Russians have substantial historical experience with secret police and political provocation and concomitantly broader linguistic usage of provokatsia in these domains. The word provocation in Russian has a Latin etymology, but has two cognates, Provokatsia and provocirovania. 
Provokatsi has a distinctly political and military association and an overwhelmingly negative balance. A provocator, especially a political one, is a stigmatized designation, which keeps company with other stigmatized terms for bad political actors, including terrorists, extremists, hackers, whereas provocatsi is a more broadly neutral term and refers to communicative behavior. Russian observers, Mikhail Pietrovsky and Michelle Berdy from the Moscow Times, were some of the first to note the notes particular or the words particularity in Russian language culture, as well as the resurgence of provokatsiya, provokator um, during the Putin era. And they noted this as early as 2012. Statistics from the National Corpus of the Russian Language confirmed their early hypothesis. The spike in usage between the early 2000s and the present is marked with significant surges in 2012 and 2014. The word's resonance among Russian speakers suggests provokatsiya's status as a cultural keyword that bears powerful, effective, and mnemonic charge. Cultural keywords, as conceptualized by sociolinguist Anna Vizhbitska, are, quote, conceptual tools that reflect a society's past experience of doing and thinking about things in certain ways and help to perpetuate these ways. As society changes, these tools do too, and they may be gradually modified and discarded, end quote. Provokatsiya in Russian reflects a culturally specific way of conceptualizing agency and blame in a conflict. And despite the word's roots in the revolutionary period of Russian history, the word provokatsiya has not been discarded. Far from it. In July 2019, Vladimir Rubinsky of Vietnamisti published an article explaining um, how everything around us has become provokatsiya. And half a year later, my own article, The Return of Provokatsiya in Putin-era Russia, was published in the Russian Review. It's hard to be faster than a journalist. Independently of one another, we arrived at very similar conclusions. Namely, that despite Russians' deep familiarity and increasing usage, the word provocation had been co-opted for the purposes of propaganda and information warfare and rendered virtually meaningless. Ruvinsky puts it in this way. The doping story, provocation period. The Scripple affair, provocation period. Interference in the US election, provocation period. And what kind of provocation it is, wherein it consists, what concretely it's connected with, let those who want to delve into it do so. And if, the, if in delving into it, they'll pour water on the mill of the, prov of the provocateurs. Now, part of the task of any scholarly discussion of provocation as a tactic, uh, rather than provocation as discourse, is therefore to restore the meaning of this profoundly corrupted and weaponized word of Russian political discourse in order to analyze its specificity as a political tactic, one which it is imperative to fully understand, especially in our completely mediatized world where local discrete provocations have um, international reach and influence a global audience. The task with regard to American language culture is different. Americans make much more limited recourse to the concept of provocation, and the word has relatively little salience in political and media discourse. It would not be unfair to say that Americans have a relatively elementary understanding of provocation. When Rush Limbaugh, a very prominent and controversial right-wing talk show radio host, died in February, the American mass media, including the Washington Post and Reuters among them, referred to him as a conservative radio provocateur. You can see the headlines. Rush Limbaugh, conservative radio provocateur and cultural phenomenon, dies at 70. And US conservative radio provocateur and Trump ally, uh, Rush Limbaugh, death. 
Rather than clarifying the nature of Rush Limbaugh's activity, the usage of the word provocateur confused many Americans who did not know what a provocateur was or how this odd French word applied to such a familiar homegrown public figure. Merriam-Webster Dictionary Online identified provocateur as a trending word the week of February 17th, 2021, when lookups of the word had spiked by 6,100% in the wake of Limbaugh's death. Rather than using the word provocation, Americans tend to employ concrete, easy to grasp metaphors, which obscure the precise operation of provocation and replace it with something else. False flag is the ready metaphor for a provocation perpetrated by an adversary undercover or masquerading in order to falsely place the blame for the violence on the target of provocation. False flag is used both in reference to geopolitical uh, provocations, but also to domestic ones. Both internationally and domestically, political conflict is increasingly driven by power politics, which seeks populist support by fueling domestic culture wars. Um, in the US culture wars, the right uses the tactic of provocation, which they refer to by the meta metaphors of triggering and owning. These metaphors are significant and revealing. A trigger is a mechanism on a gun, which causes it to fire. But as a verb, it is a transitive verb, which means to set something off like a chemical reaction or an explosion. The purpose of triggering is to offend your liberal political opponents by violating their cherished political ideals and cultural norms. Um, thus, uh, the Trump supporter wearing the t-shirt in the image that says Trump 2016, fuck your feelings. Right. The purpose of triggering, as I said, is to violate these cultural norms and to produce an outraged reaction. To own, on the other hand, is obvious. To have possession, dominion, and control over, and in the process, to humiliate your opponent. A recent example of owning the libs, a uh, very recent one from just a couple weeks ago, um, occurred in the wake of completely false rumors that circulated in the right-wing media ecosystem, charging that President Biden was going to ban hamburgers as part of his climate plan. The fake climate plan uh, hamburger ban provided the right with a prime opportunity to own the libs by flaunting their defiance through their overconsumption of hamburgers. And you can see Donald Trump Jr.'s Twitter boast that he had eaten four pounds of red meat the previous day. Scholars and commentators of right-wing political performance culture have observed that those who engage in these kinds of provocations are often willing to take a hit. That is, in other words, to inflict damage on themselves for the sake of this show of aggression and defiance towards their political opponents. And I do want to happen uh, to point out that, that this all happens virtually, right? Most of it takes place via social media. Now, in the remainder of the talk, I'd like to present two models of political provocation with the objective of elucidating profoundly influential acts of political communication and violence that are at the core of provocation. The first is a political provocation that targets supporters in order to influence and manipulate them, essentially turning them into medial extensions of the provoking actor for the purpose of achieving his or her objective. In his excellent and rigorous study of um, provocation discourse, Provetsirvani, Valentin Stepanov defines provocation and he is not speaking specifically about political provocation, as, quote, the symbolic representation of actually experienced or imitated emotions, feelings, states, with the intention of infecting their interlocutor with them and eliciting an internal state which doesn't correspond to the target's actual state. Stepanov's emphasis on the provocateur's infection of the addressee with their emotion or state 
recalls Tolstoy's definition of real art in What is Art? In fact, we need only to take minimal liberties with Tolstoy's original text and replace his word art with our word provocation to produce a wonderful um, definition of manipulative provocation that closely aligns with Stepanov's. Tolstoy's very lightly revised definition of real art applied to provocation pinpoints the nature of the violence. Quote, a real work of provocation destroys in the consciousness of the receiver the separation between himself and the provocateur, nor that alone, but also between himself and all whose minds receive this provocation. If a man is infected by the provocateur's condition of soul, if he feels this emotion and this union with others, then the object which has affected this is provocation. All right, so obviously I messed with Tolstoy's uh, definition a little bit. Um, I always was skeptical of it as a definition of art, but I do think it functions beautifully as a definition of manipulative provocation. Um, so um, for my illustrations, I have taken the two most prominent and consequential provocations in American and Russian political culture from recent months because they will be familiar to all of us, but they are highly politicized, um, as you will all know. The first is former US President Donald Trump's provocation of his supporters to insurrection at the Capitol in order to overturn the results of the November presidential election. Prior to and during his presidency, Trump had effectively used Facebook and Twitter to lead the way in provoking, that is, in triggering and owning the libs. Following the November presidential election, Trump continued to infect his supporters with his emotions and state as he made outrageous conspiracist claims about the massive voter fraud and a stolen election. At his rally prior to his supporters marching to and storming the Capitol, Trump performed defiance in his characteristic fashion through gesture, facial expression, intonation, and speech. Most significant for manipulative provocation is the deniability afforded by the device of indirect speech which Trump used consistently and to great effect. The semantic content of the speech, however, is absolutely irrelevant. What is far more crucial is the shared references and affect and his ultimate device of indirect speech to achieve his objectives. This is what Ch uh, Trump said. He said, today we see a very important event though, because right over there, right there, we see the event going to take place and I'm going to be watching because history is going to be made. We're going to see whether or not we have great and courageous leaders or whether or not we have leaders that we should be ashamed, that should be ashamed of themselves throughout history, throughout eternity, they'll be ashamed. And you know what? If they do the wrong thing, we should never ever forget that they did, never forget we should never ever forget. This indirect speech contains absolutely clear instructions to his supporters and an equally clear threat to potential obstructors among his own party. Essentially he's saying, I'm watching, do what I want you to do, otherwise your heads will be on the chopping block. Notice that he uses the first person plural form of we. Um, this is not the royal we, what it signifies is what Tolstoy referred to as the destruction of the consciousness of separation between his supporters and himself, right, the provocateur. But of course, Trump had no intention of doing anything himself, but of weaponizing his supporters to do his dirty work for him. Trump's manipulative targeting of his supporters is well captured by Stepanov's definition and its further elaboration, um, as I did with reference to Tolstoy. In his 1998 study, Stachel und Spier, Machstudien, 
German sociologist Rainer Paris elucidates a different form of provocation, provocation as an adversarial rather than as a manipulative tactic of a social movement to attract attention to its cause and to delegitimize its opponent. In the context of a longstanding conflict and an asymmetrical conflict, a social movement deploys provocation in the form of a norm violation, which poses an existential threat to its target's identity, which causes the provoked party to overreact um, to the challenge and by doing so to discredit and delegitimize itself. This is the ultimate symbolic goal of the provocation, according to Paris, the self unmasking or self exposure of the target of provocation before an audience of third party adjudicators who can be tapped as potential allies or supporters if the provocateur succeeds in displacing the blame for the conflict on the adversary and having his reality construction uh, accepted as the truth of the conflict, right? the truth of the matter. Um, Alexei Navalny's return to Moscow on January 17th was a classic and spectacularly successful instance of adversarial provocation. I'm reluctant to use the word provocation in regard to Navalny, since the word has been deployed against opposition politicians in Russia since the Balotny protests in 2012. Um, Navalny and his anti-corruption foundation have been criminalized and stigmatized in official discourse in all sorts of ridiculous ways. But without the concept of provocation, we have no precise tool with which to properly appraise the objectives and technical efficacy of Navalny's action. Two factors play a critical role in the success of Navalny's provocation, aside from its sheer audacity. The asymmetry of the conflict and the global mediatization of the action in real time and for the duration. Media attention is supremely fickle, but Navalny has managed to sustain international media attention since January. As the target of provocation, the Russian government has a plethora of resources at its disposal and the ability to game out its reaction in advance after new, all it knew that Navalny was returning. In spite of this, it overreacted in Paris's sense in a number of trivial and more significant ways most notably in the overbearing police action and the mass arrests of protesters on January 23rd. In Paris's theory of provocation, overreaction is almost guaranteed because the state is in a bind. It's in a catch-22 situation. The state must appear strong in order to maintain its legitimacy. And to do so, it relies upon the demonstration of its power and authority in the form of the exercise of state violence. Yet its overreaction consists precisely in inflicting violence upon its own citizens and therefore exposing the state's illegitimacy. Navalny provoked the state's violence against himself and his supporters before a national and global audience of third party adjudicators in the conflict. And he continued to do so successively, even in his hunger strike which can also be understood and analyzed as an adversarial provocation in Paris's terms. Paris identifies insurgent or terrorist violence as the most extreme form of adversarial provocation. But Navalny's provocation, like Pussy Riots in 2012, used nonviolent tactics to provoke the discrediting and delegitimizing violence of the state. However, provocation is nothing if not a double-edged sword, and Navalny's detractors will support the state-sponsored narrative, which is that despite the preponderance of force on the Russian state side, Navalny is to blame for provoking the violence. So I must emphasize a very important nuance. In using the concept of adversarial provocation to describe Navalny's action, I am arguing that he is provoking and exposing the violence of the Russian state rather than blaming 
Navalny for the Russian state's violence. This would be to suggest that Navalny and not Putin has control over the state's police and punitive apparatus. This is clearly not the case. The state's violence is its own responsibility, even if it relentlessly attempts to foist responsibility for the conflict onto the opposition by accusing them of provocatia. To conclude, American political culture and language culture may exhibit only a basic usage and elementary understanding of provocation. And the word provocatia in Russian language culture may be thoroughly corrupted and weaponized. Nevertheless, January 6th, um, um, uh, and as, as well as its enduring consequences, and January 17th and its sequels demonstrate that provocation is a tactic, um, a, a, as a tactic is not a sideshow and no longer confined to covert operations of the secret police, but a supremely effective attention riveting means of political communication and performance with violence at its heart. Um, thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you so much uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, colleagues, uh, at this, uh, I would urge you to ask your questions or share your observations. Uh, first and forward, we'll focus to our participants uh, who would like to ask a question to Lynn. I can't see who's raising their hands. Uh, okay, just give me a second. Uh, Lynn, so... Oh, we've got Oleg who's raising his hand. Okay, Oleg. Glivniuk, uh, could you please unmute yourselves because we can't hear you. Your microphone is off. Uh, Oleg, please unmute yourselves. We can't hear you. I, I can't. What? Irina, you can unmute yourselves. Apparently, I can't. Okay, now you've been unmuted. Well, you see, I was muted. Uh, I was told not. Well, it, it, the host uh, was supposed to give me the right to mute myself. Okay, that was very interesting. And uh, the historical evolution of the concept uh, is just something I find incredibly interesting. For a long time, when people were talking about provocation in Russia, uh, they would mean. Uh, activities uh, of agents uh, or um, uh, various uh, security departments in, in, in the revolutionary movement, uh, that, that would be considered to be a provocation. As far as I understand, uh, there has been a lot of evolution from this narrow understanding of uh, the issue. Were there any like stages, uh, iterations? Was there any evolution of the concept uh, in your opinion and these practices of provocation historically? Uh, speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Oleg, for the question. So my research on provocation began um, a long time ago um, when I was still a graduate student, and it was in conjunction with my study of the uh, movement, uh, the revolutionary movement um, and revolutionary terrorism. And provocation and revolutionary terrorism, these are two histories that are absolutely intertwined. Um, so, provocatia as a word, it entered, according to Dahl, um, it entered Russia um, during the, the epoch of Peter the Great um, from the Polish. Um, and it came into use really um, in the era of great reforms. Um, Alexander Herzen used it. Um, when the fires of 1862 were being blamed on revolutionary arsonists. And Herzen said, no, 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 this is a police provocatia, right? The police and the state are behind these fires. They are trying to cast the blame upon the revolutionaries in order to justify their repressions um, in 1862. Um, so the tactic uh, became more widespread um, after the 1881 uh, assassination of Alexander II. 
right, by the people's will. And um, the Akhrana realized it didn't have the, um, the tactics, the methods to deal with revolutionary terrorism, and that they were going to use what they called satruniki to infiltrate uh, revolutionary groupings. Um, and that's what they did. And they called them satrudniki, but uh, the revolutionaries um, used a more pejorative term, which was provocator, right? Um, which carries with it this stigma already. And then of course, this became a major part of revolutionary culture and revolutionary discourse. Um, and Vladimir Burtsev during the early revolutionary period, so um, the 1900s um, became famous or infamous for unmasking uh, provocateurs within the revolutionary parties. Um, and the culture of paranoia, I would say, pervaded um, the revolutionary parties who of course became uh, the leadership, the Soviet leadership. Um, and uh, provo uh, uh, provocator continued to be used as a stigmatized designation for an enemy. Um, and their activity became a little bit uh, hazy or foggy here, um, but throughout uh, the civil war and then in the Stalinist period. Um, and you can find its usage um, is extensive during the Cold War as well, but this is more in the realm of geopolitics. Um, and of course, uh, during um, the last couple of decades, that's where we find um, also a, an extremely um, high increase, um, sort of a predominant usage of the word provocatie, it's with reference to geopolitics and Russia's foreign adversaries. So yes, um, it has evolved tremendously and it has been used in different ways by different people. And I also want to say that this is not just a use word by state or official actors in any way. Um, you find it much more commonly used. You can hardly turn on, you know this yourself, you can hardly turn on the Russian media, um, any channel. It can be the official media, it can be dozhd without someone saying provokatsia. Uh, using that uh, to explain someone's action. Uh, спасибо. Uh, sorry, yes, Irina, Nancy, thank you so please. much. Uh, Nancy? Nancy, please. Yeah. Nancy, please. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you and so much for bringing the American story in with the Russian story. My question is whether there's an antidote to provocatia to this kind of political speech. That is, how can we get out of this loop we're in in American discourse about what um, Tim Snyder calls the big lie? You know that once you uh, call it a lie, then the other side will say, no, your lie is a lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. How can we return to a more civil discourse in either the American civil society or Russian? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, Nancy, that's a fantastic question, and I wish I had the answer. <laughs> um, yeah. But I will say that this mirroring that you say, right, so mirror allegations are a part of the whole dynamic of uh, provocation discourse, right? Um, and this happens internationally between um, the United States and Russia, and also you see domestically right, between our two uh, political cultures within our divided society. Um, I think calls for civil discourse, they are going to fall on deaf ears. Um, I, I don't think that we are going to escape the polarization and division um, and uh, provocation triggering and owning. Um, and, and this is a problem uh, I, because provocation is so much about casting blame I don't want to cast all of the blame on the Republicans, but I do want to say that so much of their political strategy currently has to do with provocation, with owning and triggering the libs, and is much less about policy, right? Policy initiatives and sort of presenting a different ideological vision to the American people, right? So they really stoke their base and win support through this strategy of provocation. And as long as that's a winning strategy for them, I don't see that they're going to give it up. Uh, 
thank you. We have one more question from the audience. It's Alosha Serada. Thank you for your talk and this very important research. In your opinion, is provocation more attractive of attack or counter defense? So that is a really interesting question. Um, I think about questions like that a lot. I also think about the question of whether I can separate adversarial provocation and manipulative provocation or whether they're both often used together, one for offense and one for defense. I will say that um, in the way that Rainer Paris conceives of um, adversarial provocation, he doesn't call it that, I call it that. He, he, he says it's a tactic of a social movement in an asymmetrical conflict, right? Where the other side, the state, the establishment has more power. Um, and so in that case, I would say that it's actually a defense, right? Um, so adversarial provocation, yes, it looks like confrontation. It looks like challenge. It looks like um, the escalation of conflict. But you have to consider what resources, what tactics a social movement has available to it um, at any given moment. Um, and also available to it to um, rivet attention, right? As an attention getting strategy, provocation is so important. You have to get the public's attention, you have to get the authorities' attention. Um, so especially in a culture, political culture, for example, in Russia, where you have basically the media domination, uh, the domination of the media by the state, right? You have state-aligned media, you have independent media on the internet. It's very hard to get people's attention. So what are you gonna do? You, you have to do something um, and you have to draw attention to your cause and keep people engaged. So in a way, maybe I'm saying it's more of a defensive strategy. It is a, a defensive, offensive strategy or an offensive defense, something like that. But that's a great question. Uh, may I ask you a question in a way? Um, I'm quite intrigued uh, by this emergence of the new generation of politicians um, deeply connected with this tactic of violence and provocation. And in a way, if we could look back, so after the Second World War, all kinds of charismatic leaders somehow were impossible because the trauma was so awful. Mm -hmm. So that was a predilection for these uh, rationalists, um, you know, and I would say politicians who use this language of tolerance uh, in a way. Uh, how would you explain why this is such a fascination towards the so-called charismatic leaders who use this abusive language and somehow, you know, are very attractive to quite a lot of people in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is a fantastic question. And I had never thought of comparing in any way Trump and Navalny. That had never occurred to me. Um, and then suddenly, when I was looking at these instances, these occasions, it occurred to me that, whoa, these are two charismatic leaders of social movements. And the strange thing was that Trump enjoyed this very liminal position. He was president, so he controlled all the levers of power, but he was also the leader of a social movement. And Navalny is as well. So suddenly we have these charismatic uh, leaders, and I think it has to do with um, not only what you said, there was a time when it was too dangerous for a charismatic leader to emerge. That's not the case right now. I think in part it has the, uh, to do with the rise of populism, right? Um, and the fact that um, because populism is the driving force of politics in a post-ideological world, right? It is how you sort of cloak yourself in the mantle of democracy and say, I have popular support, um, that there will come to the fore these charismatic leaders. But also recall, I think there's a lot of historical contingency here, 
you know, um, for a long time, there wasn't a charismatic leader of the Russian political opposition, of the liberals in Russia. Um, and God, the Republicans and the Democrats alike, I mean, they have been negative charismatics. Uh, well, except for Obama. Obama had quite a lot of charisma. Um, but so there seems to be some degree of chance about it, but I don't think we can throw out the importance of the personality in history, right? We were moving so much either to the masses in history or structural and systemic causes. And now we see again, the rise of sort of, I don't wanna say great leaders, but definitely charismatic leaders. Um, and, and that is a really interesting, um, I think it also has to do with the rise of authoritarianism and the fact that uh, more, um, uh, sort of institutional means of making the people's will, of expressing the people's will and making it felt are being blocked. So there are going to be more movements and more protests as I see it. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Lynn. Uh, really sorry to complete this part of our discussion, but uh, we are almost out of time. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we are now going on to our fourth presentation. Заставка в эфире. Спасибо большое. On air. Irina, dear colleagues, uh, dear participants, uh, those that are tuning in to our conference, uh, we are uh, continuing with uh, our Anthropology and Violence uh, Conference. And this is my great pleasure to uh, pass the floor to our fourth presenter uh, called uh, 
Uh, this is Nancy Coleman, Stanford University. Um, uh, state violence, uh, states of exception, and the role of the Tsar. That's the title of uh, the paper. And Nancy, the floor is yours. Irina, Thank you very much, Irina, for this invitation. Uh, it's uh, my great joy to be a part of the conference. I'll speak English. Apologies, uh, State Valley. And the role of the Tsar. In the spirit of the conference, I will make very broad remarks today. I'll range from the 17th century to the 19th and from state violence to private violence. My primary theme is how the Russian state used and legitimized violence in the criminal law. I begin in the 17th century, exploring the practice of the criminal law and how the state used extraordinary violence. I'll then continue on the theme of legitimate violence by tracking the use of the death penalty from the 17th century to its abolition in the late 18th century. This might make it seem that violence declined in Russia, but that is only half the story. So I will end with more ways in which the state used legitimate state violence and private violence into the 19th century. First of all, Legitimate state violence in the criminal law. In my book, Crime and Punishment in Early Modern Russia, which was translated and published by Novoye Literaturnoya Brzezhenia, thank you, I studied how the criminal law was actually practiced in the 17th century. I found that the courts followed the laws, the Ulozhenia of 1649, the Ugolovnia Statsi of 1669. Judges used appropriate procedure. They made verdicts according to the law. They assigned punishments according to the law, and they gave out a lot of mercy in the name of the Tsar to mitigate punishments. The law was violent. It used judicial torture, it used capital punishment for the highest crime, and it used lots of corporal punishment, such as beating with batagi, beating with a knout, or capital punishment generally by hanging or beheading. By the middle of the 17th century, Silka, or exile to Siberia was being used, often preceded by a knouting. Exiles were sent to support the garrison populations in Siberia. They were supposed to take on the roles that they had had before, farming peasants, artisans, musketeers. Peter the Great, as you know, introduced Katarga, which was exiled to hard labor and factory work where the conditions of labor were harsh. In all these respects, however, Russian law was very much like other continental European countries because they all shared in the revival of Roman law. England did not, it kept a jury system, but early modern France, Italy, the Netherlands, the German states, and Russia all used a version of Roman law procedure and punishments. They all used the inquisitorial method where the judge and his staff gathered up information for a written deposition instead of having both sides argue their cases. All these countries used judicial torture. They relied on torture for confession since Roman law required an unambiguous proof of guilt and torture sometimes was the only way to get that confession. But in Russia, as in Europe, the law tried to define safeguards on the use of judicial torture. The crime had to be one of the most serious, murder, repeated robbery, major theft, treason or witchcraft. There were preconditions that had to be met before torture could be used. They were things like material evidence or criminal reputation or accusation, credible accusations. So Muscovite courts used the same form of judicial torture that many West European countries did. It was called strapado. Europeans used even more worse forms of torture that Russia didn't bother with. Strapado involved flogging a person with a knout while they were raised up by the arms. In most cases that I read, the judge stopped at three sessions or even fewer than three. The Russian's law, Russian law did not limit such, did not specify such a limit, but it seems to have understood that limit and it parallels European procedure. A maximum of three sessions was indeed written into the French criminal code of 1539 and the German Carolina of 1532. However, in the most serious cases like treason and witchcraft in Europe and in Russia, Judges ignored these limits and safeguards and they used as many torture sessions as they needed to get a confession. So state violence in Russia was harsh, but it was in line with European practice. I could even argue that Russian capital punishment was less violent than in Europe in the way they did executions, but I don't have time for that now. I could talk about it in questions if you want. 
Another form of legitimate state violence was the fact that the state had the right to kill people who do things that the state and society agree are the worst crimes. Philosophers and sociologists call this the state of exception. Rene Girard, Giorgio Agamben argue that any ruler exists in a legal state of illegality because the ruler has the right to kill and is forbidden to anyone else to kill. But the ruler can only do this to protect the state's survival against a mortal threat. In modern states, the legislature creates the laws, the judiciary does the judgment, and the impersonal state executes people. In early modern political systems, the Tsar or the King lives in a state of exception. They are personally defined as the person who can order the execution, even though you're using judicial processes to establish guilt, often. You're probably thinking that the state of exception can easily slip into tyranny if the ruler has full right to use violence, and that is indeed the case, but that would be illegitimate state violence. Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible in Russia, for example, killed many people in the Aprichtina, but he did not do it for the good of the state or the society. No positive change came from the Aprichtina. So in this theory, his violence would be Ill illegitimate and he was a tyrant. State violence should serve the common good. Other Tsars did use their state of exception to kill people in order to save the state in a legitimate way, not like Ivan the Terrible. Let me give you one example. As many of you know, Moscow was racked with riots in 1648. On June the 1st, crowds streamed into the Kremlin and demanded to speak personally with the Tsar. Tsar Alexei Mihalich came out on the Krasnoye Krylso in Cathedral Square to speak with the crowd, which is rather remarkable, but they had a personal conversation many times. The crowd demanded protection against boyar corruption and crippling taxes. They demanded that specific boyars be turned over to them for their justice. Three times over five days that Tsar met with the crowd. They demanded the boyars. Sources specify that the crowd spoke mirum in, un in unanimity, which is important. They too were speaking for the community's good in a state of exception that made their violence legitimate. Meanwhile, though, rioters burned, destroyed, and murdered across the city because they were living in a state of exception. Um, only the Tsar could restore this stability by using his power, and that is exactly what Alexei Mihailovich did. He met with the crowd. He negotiated and pleaded with the crowd. Recognizing that the capital city was spiraling out of control, the Tsar took excruciating steps. Over two days, he sacrificed two boyars to the crowd, Plusheyev and Trahanyotov. The crowd tried to replicate some of the rituals of a legitimate execution, but really very quickly and brutally, they killed these two men. On June 5th, the crowd returned again and asked for the Tsar's brother-in-law and mentor, Boris Ivanich Morozov. He was the most corrupt and the most hated boyar. Alexei Mihailovich begged and pleaded, and he took a solemn religious oath that he would send Morozov away. I think it's remarkable to imagine the Tsar taking an oath on the cross. Satisfied with the two sacrifices and the Tsar's oath, on that last day, the crowd stopped the violence and they went away. So the state of exception and the two sacrifices had saved, had been done for the common good. And as many of you know from the life of Peter the Great, a very similar ritual drama uh, occurred in 1682. So this was the Tsar killing his own men in a state of exception for the good of the community. So as I've said, capital punishment in the regular courts or in exceptional moments like these was one of the central forms of legitimate state violence in Russia. So you might be surprised to hear that Russia led all European states in abolishing capital punishment in the 18th century, but it's a very complicated story, not as straightforward as it seems. In the 1740s, Empress Elizabeth asked the Senate to abolish capital punishment. No one is really sure why she did this, perhaps religious faith, it was probably not enlightenment values because they weren't so common in her day as they would be two, two decades later in Catherine's time. Perhaps it was a pragmatic decision that she wanted to reassure the nobles who had put her into power in a coup, that she would not use capital punishment on them. Empress, Elis Empress Anna in the 1730s had shocked the nobility with some executions of noblemen. Another motivation might have been that Russia had been decreasing the use of capital punishment anyway, replacing it with exile. That was happening already in the late 17th century. A similar phenomenon is happening with Peter the Great when he introduces a form of political death called Sholmavanya for high-ranking people. Such people were sentenced to death, 
but it was a political and social death, a shameful exclusion from society. So this reduced the use of the death penalty. Peter the Great also insisted that all death penalties be given to a higher court for review. Condemned people were sent to exile while they waited for that review. And in reality, backlogs of cases developed and the criminal stayed in exile. So uh, Peter did this in essence because he needed the labor force for his projects like St. Petersburg and Azov. Uh, so the abolition of capital punishment by Empress Elizabeth followed this pattern and in a sense continued in this gradual decline of the use of capital punishment. The Senate didn't want to do it. They waited a good 10 years. They ignored Empress Elizabeth for a decade. And finally, in 1754, they formalized all this procedure. They simply said all capital punishments would be reviewed by the Senate. Meanwhile, the convict would be sent to eternal exile until the review, and the reviews never happened. Backlogs rose up, but it was understood that the reviews would not happen. These people were in exile. And uh, as a result, to control the most dangerous criminals, they created a more, a more elaborate system of branding to identify capital criminals in exile. So of course, as you know, capital punishment continued for the highest crimes like treason, Pugachev, the Decembrists, and others, but very few. Otherwise, for most crime, Russia did not execute. And gradually they began to decrease other forms of violence in the judicial system torture, branding, and nouting from the 1760s to the mid 19th century. The laws, however, did not really formally say that capital punishment had been abolished until the Criminal Code of 1845. This defined capital punishment in a way that is like the state of exception we discussed. The state can kill people for assaults on the Tsar and the state. That's all, nothing else. You, killing a bishop, killing your father, heresy, arson, none of them qualified for the death penalty, only threatening the state and the Tsar. This tells us a lot about the ideology of the state. This is not done out of humanitarian enlightenment values. This is not a reflection of the civilizing process that Norbert Elias talks about. This is very old thinking about the autocrat. This is the Tsar being the patrimonial father to his people. Only his person and the state he embodies is worth the sacrifice of a life. The Tsar is legitimate because he protects his people from harm. So we have seen that Russia used a lot of state violence legitimately, legitimately in the criminal law and in capital punishment, and that by the end of the 18th century, the use of physical violence was declining in the criminal law. But this is only part of the story. The state continued to use a lot of violence legitimately in other forms, both public and private. So I want to give you that added perspective. First of all, we should remember that the exile system was very violent. It was forcing people to move, controlling their mobility and their location, and in many cases, forcing them to do backbreaking labor. Secondly, it's very important to remember that the state used uh, martial law across the realm uh, against civilian populations, that is generally in the borderlands. John Ledun has written an article on this. Military law was very violent with lots of executions and lots of corporal punishment. Governor generals in the Kazakh steppe, in the Caucasus and in Central Asia used military law to rule local populations, not using the laws or the administrative structures of the heartland that I have just been discussing. So the abolition of Capital punishment was only for the heartland, not for the borderlands. And finally, we should remember that until 1861, the state supported serfdom. This is a form of private violence that was essential to the economy and the social hierarchy of the state. It's a mixture of public and private violence, a total institution of the daily life of over half of the Russian population. Serfdom, like the exile system, was by its nature violent. It prevented people from moving and from choosing their life path. Serfs were subject to corporal punishment by their landlords, by bailiffs, and by village elders. Their families and communal elders made life choices like marriage and remarriage and recruitment to the army. The experience of serfdom, however, was very diverse. About 50% of the serfs were on landlord estates. The other half were state peasants whose life was easier in principle because they didn't have a landlord. And everywhere the conditions of work were so different that we can't say there was a common experience of serfdom. It depended on the kind of regime. Did you pay an abrok 
a cash fee, or did you do barshana, which is work on the landlord's estate directly? Barshana was much, much harsher and more coercive. The serf's experience depended upon the size of the estate, how much the landlord or his bailiff interfered with the serf's lives, how strict the peasant elders were. The experience of serfdom varied by age and gender. Some people have called the communal authority of the village elders a tyranny of the old men over the young men and a tyranny of the men over the women. So serfdom was private violence protected by the state, essential to st social stability. Even though we can say that the experience of its violence differed with every serf, it's very significant that serfdom in the 19th century was perceived as violent and abusive, at least in the intellectual thought. Certainly, Alexander Radishev in 1791 condemned serfdom both for humanitarian reasons, that is that all men should have liberty, and also because of its violence. You know his vignettes, he depicts physical violence, sexual violence, psychological, and emotional violence. In the first half of the 19th century, some European travelers considered Russian serfdom abusive, such as Marquis de Boussin in, in 1839 and August von Hochshausen. He traveled to Russia in 1843. Alexander Herzen passionately wrote about the cruelty of serfdom in Colocol from London. And in the 1840s, Russian novelists were daring to depict the abuses of serfdom. Ivan Turgenev in Zapiski Ahotnika and Dmitry Gigorovich in novels and stories. And even in art, I'd like to share the screen quickly to just show you one picture, if I can, here. Um, let's see here. Does that do? Well, you can see this picture. I can't. There. Can you see the entire picture? Anyway, this is Repin, even though he did this after the reforms, Ilya Repin's painting of 1881-83 of the coarse cross procession to me has always been about violence. Let's see. Um, I've always thought the focal point of this picture is this man beating the peasant. Okay. So in conclusion, it's impossible to say whether Russia was more or less violent than its contemporaries. It's not a question we can begin to pose. We don't have means of comparison for Europe, for Russia or other Eurasian countries. We don't have statistics of court cases and punishments. We don't have crime rates. We can't generalize. We can only speak of patterns and individual moments. But we have seen that early modern Russia used legitimate state violence in many ways to punish criminals, eventually to protect subjects of the Tsar from capital punishment, to enforce the exile system, to enforce colonial control in the borderlands and support serfdom in the heartland. The judicial system served society. It's also undeniable that it served the self-interest of the state and the elites more than the whole populace. So perhaps the most important thing we conclude is that there was no one experience of violence in the Russian empire. It varied by place, by social rank and class, by age and gender. We should avoid essentialist conclusions. Russia was no more violent than the rest of Europe. Russia used its state violence in the same way that most other early modern empires did. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting um, talk. Uh, I'm going to switch uh, to Russian. Are there any questions? Uh, from our colleagues to Nancy. Lynn, uh, please go ahead. Okay, Nancy. I, Nancy. This is the question I would have asked if I were sitting in your class. So um, the, the question is, um, how does this narrative that you presented align with Foucault's master narrative. Uh, you talked about Agamben, you talked about Girard. Um, I, I know that other scholars have touched upon, like Laura Ingelstein, um, Foucault's applicability to, to the Russian context. Do you see any of his um, concepts and frameworks as useful? Um, you know, the most famous of them is the spectacle of the scaffold, right? Oh, sure. uh, but but then there is the whole trajectory of his narrative, um, you know, from from that um, and sort of the, the the torture of the body, um, you know, to sort of restore the body politic. 
um, and, and then going to sort of the disciplinary institutions. Um, and here, your narrative, as I understood it, so much was coming from directly from the top, from the Tsar, and from more archaic ideas about um, the, the Tsar's state of exception in relationship to the people. Um, and only relatively late in the story uh, do you bring in sort of the paradigm of modernity um, and sort of uh, the new modern sensibility about bodily autonomy and rights and that kind of thing. So, so what would you say, um, since you've presented this sort of um, mural, uh, so to that question, how would you fill it in? <laughs> well, I th oh golly, it's, there's so much of Foucault, I'm not an expert. Um, I would say, first of all, I didn't include this, but um, I've always been impressed that Foucault has taught us that violence is everywhere. It penetrates everything in society. I didn't stress that enough, but that I find myself thinking all the time of how coercive uh, institutions in Muscovy and modern Russia, most societies uh, can be at their core. Um, but in terms of Foucault's historical progression, he argues that spectacles of suffering were used to terrify people into conformance until you could impinge discourses in their minds of behavior of normality and deviance, and then you can hide your violence in the prison and um, and, and, and do your violence more indirectly. Um, and Russia obviously follows that path to some extent. Russia never had the spectacles of suffering. I could give you a long entertaining summary of how executions were done a lot more simply and quickly in Muscovy until Peter the Great observed a spectacle of suffering in Amsterdam. And once he saw it, he came back Quick, we all know the story. He came back very quickly from his European tour to put down an, an uprising of the Musketeers in 1698. And he, he did a European style spectacle of suffering in punishing 600 Musketeers by hanging them and beheading them and putting them on wheels using punishments that had never been done before in Russia um, because he saw it in Europe. But by and large, that was only for really bad crimes. Um, he did that a few more times, but generally the judicial system kept up very simple little hangings and beheadings. The speed was the terror of executions. So, um, but Russia then does follow this path, uh, and, and I don't, towards the Foucauldian model of internalizing violence, at least in the center would say Russia diverges in the sense that in the borderlands, they never uh, uh, bothered not to use the gauntlet and other horrific forms of violence. So that the historical progression is quite uneven. Jonathan Daly has written about prisons in Russia. He finds anything um, statistically not quite using as much coercive power as um, in other societies in the late 19th century. But at any rate, I would think that Russia follows the institutional path of Foucault's ideas. As for how well the internalized discourses of, of, of were in, inculcated, I don't know that that happens so strongly in Russia because of a lack of a, of a, good, of a good educational system and the many, many languages and diversities of the empire and that sort of thing. The messaging was probably not as good and therefore the social disciplining not as good going into the 19th century. So I don't have a absolute answer for you. Apologies, are there any further questions? Evgeny, please go ahead. Uh, could you please unmute yourself? Evgeny, 
Evgeny, we can't hear you. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Is it now? Oh, uh, thank you, Nancy, for uh, for your um, presentation. And I, I would like to ask you because actually in in Russian we have um, we have um, um, much trouble translate uh, translating this, uh, um, this uh, translating this term by uh, George Agamben. Yes, the state of exception. Yes. Yeah. So because here it's uh, uh, more more correct. Yes, it's sustaining exclusion. But in Russian we have this tendency to to read this uh, this idea through Carl Schmidt. And in Russia, very often it's, uh, it is uh, translated like uh, Yes, and which is okay. not completely the same. Yes, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not at all the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so we have this confusion in the Russian discourse of space, yes, between state of, uh, state of exceptions, yes, and emergency state. And so, and I, I think that I believe that maybe so, um, so this topic about the abolition of capital punishment. It maybe in the sense what you're uh, explaining, it was the source of uh, uh, what uh, what Agamben uh, called yes, the, the um, so the permanence of state of exception. So the mm -hmm. fact the fact that the capital punishment yes in Russia was abolished very early yes in the in the middle of 18th century. So it's uh, some somehow yes uh, it was a provocation so to say yes uh, it forced the government to 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 uh, to look yes for the other way. To use the capital punishment, it's just like uh, it's a kind of analogies of capital punishment, like you say in the colonial practices in borderlands or under military laws. Yes, because uh, we all know that a lot of uh, punishment in the army, like this famous oh. beating with the sticks, it was the it gauntlet. Was, yeah, the yes, gauntlet. actually, pragonskoy stroy. It was virtually an uh, it was virtually an, uh, an analog of capital punishment. So, so that, that's my question. Don't you think that the fact that uh, of this very early, and so uh, m maybe someone could say a pre premature, yes, abolishment of capital punishment was um, um, it? Uh, it has uh, well contributed to the fact that this uh, uh, state of exception, yes, was mm -hmm. was permanent till actually the end of uh, till the end of ancient regime, yes, of tsarist regime. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. because uh, the, the government and the police, uh, so they were looking for, for the practices who were an analogous. analogous. Mm -hmm. And this is what Alec told in his, in his presentation too. Yes, he said that actually there were capital punishments, but there were mm -hmm. also a lot, of the, uh, a lot of different punishments who were um, almost so analogous to capital punishment. So people mm -hmm. were exiled, they were put in the, in the gulag and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, and all, all this, it's, it actually failed to this definition of state, state of exception. Yeah. So don't you think that this fact of this aboli early abolition of capital punishment so contributed to this uh, perma uh, permanent state of uh, exception that was uh, uh, ruled in in uh, in yeah. Paris, uh, um, so jur jur juridical system? Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's interesting. It seems like a paradox, you know, because initially you would say, oh, they're abolishing capital punishment. There's less exception because they're less willing to use extreme violence. But as you summarize it, and as I think through it, it seems to me that maybe indeed the abolition of capital punishment was some, um, some combination of humanitarian belief. This was an orthodox state that, you know, these Tsars had to present themselves as orthodox, patrimonial, benevolent people to their rulers, as well as a pragmatic decision because as far as the goals of the state, they continued to have, as you say, all of the violence they needed to accomplish their goals. They didn't need capital punishment in the center to, to punish criminals. They could send them to Siberian exile and brand them in ways that they would always be recognizable if they ever tried to escape back to the center. Um, they could then get good use from their labor. They could populate Siberia with lesser criminals um, so that, and then meanwhile, they could do on the borderlands with martial law what they needed. So there was no real, in a sense, the, the means of violence were so effective and vibrant that capital punishment was just one of the many. So the state of exception is still there. And the Tsar could always call it and say, oh, I'm going to execute five Decemberists um, because that was treason. Um, yeah. So it, I, we haven't 
the, the abolition of capital punishment, I still don't quite know exactly how, but I do not want to let anyone think that it was just a, a kind humanitarian gesture because this was still an empire based on a lot of coercive violence. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, then I have one <laughs> for me. Okay. You know, it's very, it's very encouraging. It's very encouraging to read um, your books and to listen to you and knowing that Russia um, until 1917 was in the same trend as in other countries, <laughs> in a way. It's a great idea. <laughs> somehow quite a positive thing but uh, thinking about the state violence if we look at it not from the direct uh, point of view or meaning that's capital punishment when it was used in a way but you know the whole system of government in a way i mean this uh, russian absolutism uh i would say rigid social structures and um you know this low uh, social lifts in the 19th century, in a way, served them, which you mentioned already, in a way. Uh, in a way, could we combine all the things and realize that they're probably the, uh, the, the atmosphere, the whole situation of violence, I would say, in the society because of this very specific, um, you know, way of governing with our absolutism, uh, somehow should be... Uh, taken into account as well. Not only capital punishment, the use of it or non use yeah. but in yeah. a way this, um, you know, the, the, the whole atmosphere within the society. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow, how, how this Russian terrorist suddenly appeared, or mm -hmm. why, you know, the Russian revolution somehow was realized in such a brutal way, in many other ways. Uh, yeah. somehow, how we should look on this indirect ways of while yeah. penetrating the, the Russian society? Well, uh, I, I have, I think, two ways about that, because on the one hand, this is an immense empire that is very diverse across the board. And Alexander Herzen, when he still lived in Russia, said something about, they, you know, there's, it's such terrible local government that nothing happens and that leaves us alone to do what we want. <laughs> you know, that is, there wasn't, I don't, I think that in many, many cases, people could live their lives out, even serfs, and not feel the heavy hand of the state on them other than taxation and recruitment and things like that. But the feeling that we're living in a violent society may not have been that palpable to people who, who lived in a city, who lived in the countryside, depending upon their personal circumstances. Uh, of course, the industrial cities were horribly violent if you take, you know, epidemics and public health to be a form of violence against the working class who couldn't escape it, I suppose. But uh, so on the one hand, it, I think you could make the argument that it was such an undergoverned society and Mironov and lots of people have argued that, um, that you could escape a feeling of a heavy hand of violence. Um, on the other hand, as you say, intellectual thought, that is the intelligentsia, the educated people, understood and spoke from about the 1830s um, uh, perceiving their own society as violent. And I'm, I suspect that that has to do with comparisons to Europe and understanding, yes, not only are we backward, but we're backward in ways that are coercively violent. We beat, we beat serfs, we keep serfdom happening. Um, and um, it's unjust. And then the, 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 the wide array that I mentioned of Radishev and Turgenev and Grigorievich and um, artworks and works of social criticism um, all begin to talk about violence, you know, that becomes the reality no matter how diverse the actual experience of uh, life in the realm is if the intellectual class begins to understand that their society is is uh, primarily violent. So you go from you know novels by Turgenev in the 1840s to Bakunin and anarchism by the 1870s. You know um, all along that interpretation of society. So I don't think we can say what the actual experience of 
living, whether it was felt completely violent all the time through the 19th century. But once the perception was that it was violent, then that's the reality too. Oh, thank you. Uh, коллеги, если какие-то еще вопросы к докладчику? Colleagues, are there any further questions to our presenter? Okay, people are, I guess, suppressed and they're silenced. Uh, well, and thank you so much, Nancy, to you. Thank you very much to all of our participants. Uh, uh, and this is the end of the first day of uh, our uh, readings. Uh, and I'm cordially inviting everybody to uh, tune in tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, we will have uh, a section on war and violence. Uh, and uh, please continue to actively participate and stay engaged. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, and see you tomorrow. Oleg, uh, tomorrow we're going to be on YouTube, right? Uh, we're off air now.